All right, everybody, welcome to Tesla Today. Lots of incredible news happened this weekend. We'll give you an update on all of them. First of all, there's uh, Cybertruck sightings that's coming out fast and furious now. There's 180 vehicles that are covered in Giga Shanghai. There's a crash that Cruise Robotaxi had this weekend as well. And we're going to spend some time sharing with you the net promoter score. This is a key metric that everybody in the industry is using to measure how likely uh, customers are to sh recommend a product. And we're going to show you what Tesla's is, as well as all of the different Chinese manufacturers. We've got Jeff Lutz with us today. Jeff is an ex-supply chain executive. He worked at Motorola, Lenovo, and Google. But more importantly, he was actually the ex-chief quality officer for, for a couple of these companies. And so he's the perfect person to share with us how important these uh, net promoter scores are. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you for joining me every Monday. Great to be with you. So first of all, one of the things I, you and I have been talking about just uh, recently is what's happening to the stock. Let's start with that. So we've seen the stock obviously fall over last week. It's gained a little bit today, but you had some good points about what happened last week, but also what we're expecting this week. Um, tell me more about that, Jeff. Yeah, a couple of technical indicators. Obviously, in the last couple of weeks, we fell through the the 50 day. We fell through the 200 day last week, which is that. 221.91 and we we went down you know a, a little bit more kind of overshot it a bit which isn't uh uncommon um uh, that we did bounce off of it uh initially but then we, we you know we descended a little bit lower again not a, uncommon to overshoot it the rsi the relative strength indicator um was actually i think last friday it 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 bottomed out at 12. that's a really low rsi for a stock that's like using a two-week average i believe uh, if you get below 30 on the rsi you're oversold is is the term and i think if you get above 70 i think you're overbought so tesla was at 12. um so technically that's an indicator if you if again if you subscribe to like technical indicators but this morning there were it was an analyst no doubt from baird uh basically saying some some pretty promising things to come for tesla in the second half we know that we're going to talk through some of that uh, on this on this call, but again, technically oversold, bit of a bounce here. Nvidia is also leading the way. Q's doing well. They're kind of going up together, uh, which is good. Nvidia's Nvidia's got earnings on Wednesday. That will really, you know, either torch the market uh, and burn it to the ground, or or literally, I think, set it on fire and restart <laughs> um, the tech rally. So maybe a fire in e either way. Oh, no. Okay, so we're going to wait for NVIDIA on Wednesday. Uh, okay, so well, we keep hearing more and more Cybertrucks. Uh, so we saw this video come out, which I'll play shortly. The, this is Gregor truck. We like him. He says, this red truck left early this morning, Texas time. This is an additional transport of trucks from last night. In the last 24 hours, at least 11 Cybertrucks. And we've been seeing these go uh, all over the country. So here's the quick video. There is your... Cybertrucks on the way. So Jeff, oops. Jeff, we've been seeing Cybertrucks all over the country. What do you think is happening? Where are we in this stage? Well, I, I would say on the positive side, it's great to see the frequency increasing of vehicles leaving. That that uh, the, I think the video was from SC Robinson Jr. He's been doing a, a great job capturing videos and, and Gregor Truck as well. Uh, I believe um, you said that there was, I think that there were 11 um, that went out. So we're in the early stages. We built um, a release candidate vehicle, showed that off in July, and we're basically building successive vehicles um, to continue to like exercise the line as well as get through the remaining test cases to move from release candidate to production. Now, we don't know if that line's already been crossed, if they've if they've if they've moved internally from release candidate to production that would be something for tesla to announce or not announce um, but i don't see these vehicles you know wrapped uh, i don't see i don't see them you know i see them going out for for further testing is what i see which you know these engineering teams need it uh, the reliability teams need vehicles um, so we saw some going out last week for crash testing um, if they are doing you know there was rumors of a cyber ui you know the software team and you know We'll need some for drive tests. They can do most of their work, you know, via simulators. But you know, in, at some point, you want to drive test your code. So um, it's great. So I think bottom line, the frequency is increasing. 
Um, it's great that, you know, because that's how lines start. They start at low volumes, low rates. And then you, what you try to do station by station on the line is increase the velocity of the output and then detect what new uh, failure modes you see while you're working on your existing failure modes. Uh, so hopefully we're getting closer and closer to an announcement uh, of a launch event. Um, you know, the, the more and more of these vehicles we see. Yeah, but I it's like the first time I've actually seen like or I've heard of any new vehicle. It's all over multiple states. I mean, some people are thinking maybe they're doing advertisements. You think that could be the case? I you know what? I I I mean, it's it's possible, um but I mean, it, there's a lot of it, it's pretty viral on the web. Uh, so I don't know if it needs to be in one particular state uh or another. Uh and again, this, you know, it says, I think, over 1.8 million pre-orders. So there's certainly no shortage of information online about the product. I think they're going through test cases um, and and they're running the product through, uh, to, again, to, to get it from re release candidate is, is you believe you're on the final production tooling you're, you're in, and every part is production tooled and you, you believe you've got a final assembly process in what you're doing is you're just validating your your X factory test test cases uh, to ensure that that is indeed the case. So I I believe they're proceeding. That's what I believe they're doing. They may have, like I said, they may have already completed that and they're into some low levels of of production. You know, we'll see. All right. Well, Cybertruck is here, and it's uh, so exciting because we have we can see multiple new vehicles coming out, and here's 180 wrapped cars sitting in Giga Shanghai's logistic lot. When will Tesla reveal the new Model 3? Rumors speculate a launch in late August or September. Either way, it shouldn't be too far off now. So here's the photo. You're seeing all these cars out in a lot. So, but they're still covered. Um, what's your thinking about their progress here? Yeah, it's Oops. the photo's not updating on my screen. Maybe it's it's something oh, there, there nope. it goes. Yeah. Um yeah. so yeah, I I I believe they're they're going through a line conversion uh right now. And you know, I, I think in Tesla's future gigafactory plans if not their existing gigafactory plans they're probably going to want to build a covered you know carport lot uh to put um new you know new production vehicles they they don't want detected via drone uh so for now yeah they're covering them you know and keeping them under wraps um which is which is encouraging it's exciting um so it it'll be interesting to see what's actually changed in the model three what i'm most excited about are the cogs reductions i believe that they figured out a significant, you know, how to reduce a significant uh, portion of cogs uh, from the vehicle while making it actually uh, a higher quality vehicle. Um, and I think there's updates. I think there's updates to the the, the headlights, the taillights. That's why we see them covered. Um, but I mean, I know there's a lot of rumors about like sportier body contouring. I hope that's the case. Um, what, what, what would be better than, you know, to take the cost structure down and make it look even a little bit more sporty. Um, but I, I'm not sure that that's the case. I just know what I see covered on the vehicle, um, in testing. And then there's rumors about hardware, a uh, hardware three and a half versus a hardware four, um, for FSD. Uh, so Tesla's going to support, you know, there's over 4 million cars out there. Many, you know, most of those are on hardware three. So Tesla is going to support that configuration. They think that can get to, you know, you know, full self-driving levels of performance. And, and they believe, you know, hardware four will be that many times better. Um, but, you know, so we'll see. These are right now, they're all rumors. Tesla's done a pretty good job of keeping um, the details and the specs of both the Cybertruck and the, the, the Model 3 refresh under wraps. So... That's very hard to do when you have that many em employees and suppliers involved. So they, they've got a pretty good thing going in their supply chain and their factory. So just hats off to the supply chain and the uh, Tom Zoo's team to, to, you know, to keep these things under wraps uh, all the way to the launch date. That, that's a great thing for, for Tesla. It's a great thing for also uh, for consumers. So Jeff, with your experience um, with, with product launches and so forth, between the two, the revised Model 3 and the Cybertruck, which one do you think is actually, you know, we've been seeing sightings of both of them. We've seen them covered. We've seen them multiple states. Uh, we're seeing more and more of them. Which one is ahead of the other or are they both going to come out at the same time? And how would you 
uh, announcements. You'll probably do two separate, or would you just do one for Cybertruck? What do you think? What are you expecting? Um, so the first question is, is, um, is one ahead of the other. Um, I, you know, I believe the model three refresh is going to use, uh, is going to have high reuse with, uh, the current model three, and they're going to make, they're going to make the changes critical to, to cogs or critical to reliability and performance improvements. So that one should be easier to ramp and the, So they should be able to get their output per day up much faster than a cyber truck. Cybertruck's all new parts. That's, you know, when we talk about reuse, um, you, you compare reuse, like what percent of reuse of the bill of material and the, the assembly processes and test processes you use from one launch to the other. I would venture to guess that Cybertruck is very near um, to a zero. I mean, maybe they're using, um, you know, existing motors, maybe from, from Model S Plaid. We, we don't know that yet. We'll see. Um, but I would say there's, there's, you know, comparing the Cybertruck to the Model 3, there's, there's far less reuse in the Cybertruck, far new things in the factory, far new things to procure. And with that, you know, comes some slowness and, and delays in the beginning. So that'll be a slower ramp up. But I also think the Cybertruck's been designed in a way from a design for manufacturability perspective to go, to go through the factory faster with less parts. So Tesla's you know, again, they view their factory as a product. And I believe that they're focused on, you know, every generation of product that goes through that factory when they redesign the factory and then they do the DFX work on the product. They're focused on output per square meter. They're focused on the velocity of the product through the line. And they're focusing on making sure that line is balanced. And um, so I believe that progressively every new vehicle going into every new factory is going to be faster and cheaper to build in its individual segment. So yeah, Cybertruck will be a little bit slower out the gate. All right. Lots of other news that happened this weekend. One of them was Cruise had an accident with a fire truck this weekend in San Francisco. And because of that, the, uh, the California Department of um, DMV has forced Cruise to reduce their self-driving fleet by 50%. And I think that that means 50 cars during the daytime and 150 at nighttime in San Francisco. So what happened was um, there was a accident, and my understanding of what happened was um, the cruise was actually had a green light and it moved forward, but they he didn't they didn't recognize the emergency vehicle, a fire truck with its blaring siren, and so the fire truck hit cruise. There was a passenger in the cruise, and I don't think it was serious, but they did uh, take them to the hospital. But I think they're fine. And this is cruise's response a little after 10 p.m. Uh, last night, one of our cars was in a collision, and we wanted to provide an update of what we know at this time. It uh, The car entered the intersection on a green light and was struck by an emergency vehicle that appeared to be en route to an emergency scene. Our, our car contained one passenger who was treated on scene and transported via ambulance from what we believe are non-severe injuries or injuries. And of course, our primary concern is the rider and their welfare, welfare we're investigating to better understand. So the DMV said that we need to investigate. In the meantime, let's cut it by 50% until the investigation is complete. Um, and they've agreed to that. So that's where we got the number of 50 driverless cars in operation during the day and 150 driverless vehicles in operation at night. Um, this is much of the same that we've already reported here. Yeah, so what's your thinking about all this? I mean, obviously this is not good news and I hope that um, it doesn't, you know, it's good that Cruise is already out there but we don't want to see more and more of these accidents. No, uh, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that Cruise was operating overnight, I think from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. until very recently. And, and now they were given a permit to operate, you know, during the day, increase the number of vehicles. And I mean, from a 50,000 foot level, you know, the more of these vehicles that are on the road, the more of the probability of, of, of a crash occurring. Just there's the, you know, the, uh, opportunity count is higher. Um, however, you, obviously we need to look at it just like we do with the Tesla data. We need to look at this data in context as well. Obviously every crash is going to be under the microscope and we don't want anybody seriously or injured or anybody um, obviously uh, hurt more seriously in a, in a crash. But we have to look at the data and understand like, well, what's the, what, what are the miles driven? What are the incidents per miles driven? And I would probably venture to guess that Cruise is probably doing better 
than human driving. Um, so we have to keep all of this in context and understand that, you know, there's, you know, that this is going to happen as this grows. However, um, the question is, is how good is crew as crews at dealing with edge cases? And this is, this is going to be the, the Achilles heel, I think of autonomous driving until, um, you know, there's a better AI, more generalized AI that can work through these edge cases. And in, and this brings me back to kind of the genius of Tesla, having the driver in the seat, the driver signing a release saying you're accountable, calling it a quote unquote level two car. Everybody gets hung up on level two versus three versus four. Meanwhile, allowing the car to operate in shadow mode, op allowing the car to operate in full self-driving with the driver being attentive and continuing to improve the performance of it. I, I Again, I still believe that Tesla has the most, um, from a safety perspective, they have the most scalable solution, technically the most scalable solution and from a unit economics uh, perspective, you know, what's the cost to re-engineer and remanufacture each one of these bolts for crews? I don't know the number, it's probably pretty high. When you have to send a car through the manufacturing process, then bring it back and then remanufacture it with all these sensors and all these cameras. So they're gonna have to figure the unit economics side of well, but just getting back to these incidents, you know, I think it's gonna be under the microscope for a bit but we always have to look at this data, whether it's Tesla or a Tesla competitor and look at it in context to human driving. Yeah. In fact, actually Tesla is the safest approach because it's still human supervised. And, you know, we get the brunt of the attacks of how the, how da un dangerous it is, but if actually these car companies that are out there, which I'm glad that they are, but it's more dangerous because they're fully autom autonomous at this point which is great actually, because again, when you compare the actual um, accidents, it's much, much smaller <laughs> than humans. And um, and then when you rank, this is one from, came from Omar, when you rank these uh, car brands by total crashes, it's actually Waymo is number one, Cruise is number three, and number two is this trans stuff, which we're already seeing out there, right? But just as they drive slowly, but they still make mistakes. And so like you say, uh, Tesla's approach will be much better, okay. So, Jeff, you had this tweet. We've been seeing the discussion between the institutional analysts about the rate and impact of price cuts and what Gary Black and uh, Dan Ives have been doing when they go on CNBC and other news shows is they've kind of uh, indicated that, kind of pointing out that, yes, there is price cuts, but they're small in magnitude, they're small in impact because it's really just, you know, the select of trims. And then you said, as uh, in, in your opinion – the cost of goods reductions are now outweighing um, the the price cuts. And so, you know, for you, it's not a big of a deal. Let's watch what Dan Ives says, and then let's see what uh, Gary Black responded. Why the outsized performance versus everybody else right now, just right now? Sure, it's because the price cuts that everyone's worried about late last week. Now, as we've actually dug into it, I think the market's starting to understand, it was really only 10, 12 percent of the models impacted from Model Y. A big sell-off in Tesla was because a lot of these price cuts worries that there's going to be more and more of a price war. We believe 95% of that's in the rearview mirror. The other thing, David, that's important, demand in China, we believe, is actually starting to uptick relative to what we've seen the last few weeks. And I think that's why Tesla's reacting accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, plus, if we get a strike vote well, later this week, we'll see what it means relative to the legacy. Oh, and, yeah. Hey, look, the 313 area code continues to have one hand behind their back with UAW. Right. <laughs> 313. Okay. So Gary Black replied to you in addition to what Dan, Dan I've just said. He said, the problem is, to your reply, is any cost of goods decline is aspirational and speculative while price cuts are tangible and immediately discounted. So even though Gary Black is saying that, yes, the price cuts are slowing down and they're marginal, he still thinks that um, he hates price cuts. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah. I mean, who doesn't hate uh, price cuts when it, you're having a gross margin? conversation but remember let's go back to why tesla is doing this tesla is doing this to keep their factories and their supply base um heavily utilized if they can keep them heavily utilized during these you know call them high interest you know uh loan periods you know you know slow down or not a slow down they're keeping their supply base going and they're keeping their factories going and scaling and what that's going to bring them are greater COGS declines versus starting and stopping them or lowering volumes to the factory. So it's going to allow the EV uh, adoption curve to continue to progress. And then once you get, you know, 
you're basically going to get to escape velocity here, which we're, we're getting close to pretty soon globally with already, I think, 13% <clears throat> EV adoption. Um, but to answer Gary's question on that, um, there's the, the thing I've expressed both to Gary and, the, and to other analysts more broadly is there's very few analysts that do a cog side analysis. And that's one of the problems out there. So let's let's break down the situation on the Model Y. Um, you know, there were nineteen hundred dollar price cuts across um, a, a you know eighteen percent of the population in China, which is six percent of the vehicle population globally. It amounts to if you if you estimate that we're going to do four hundred seventy thousand deliveries, one hundred eighteen dollars per car. So that's 03 percent of cogs, and you know, from Q1 to Q2, Tesla, and this is data from um, Troy did some really good work on on COGS. I, get, I should give credit to, and I do in this tweet. And um, if you look, there's about a $1,218 difference between quarter one of this year and quarter two of this year in cost of goods sold. And if you take that $1,218 and divide it into what were the COGS in Q1, that's a 3.2% decline. So we have pricing reductions that are one tenth of the of the uh, of what Tesla's already been able to demonstrate on the cog side and i believe that's just that's going to continue with their event driven reductions again an event driven reduction is when the engineering team or the supply chain team or tom zoo's team you know takes apart takes a design or takes something in the factory and says i'm eliminating that i'm changing that i'm opening the spec I'm making that process simpler, faster, and boom, they cut it into the factory. Tesla does cut-ins faster than any anybody I know of in this. So um, I could probably make a model on COGS, but the, the, the key takeaway is so far, we're already more than halfway through the quarter, and the aggregate in, in, in cuts, at least in the configurator, is about 0.3% of COGS. Now, some other people have responded and said, well, there's inventory price cuts. My response there is, well, how many vehicles is that? Is it 5,000 inventory vehicles? Is it 10,000? You're still dividing those numbers into 470,000 vehicle shipments if you think that they're going to get there. You're roughly in that area this quarter. So the point is, is all that needs to be taken into context. If you think they've done 118 in, in price reductions, double it, triple it. The point is, is it's, it's still 10 times. They're still doing 10 times that on the COG side. And I believe with the, the deflationary figures we're seeing out of China, China's actually in disinflation. They're having negative PPIs, which means it's not only that their, their producer price increases have slowed down, they're actually negative for a month on month. And <clears throat> Tesla does a tremendous amount of production in China. Tesla sources a lot out of China for other factories too. So all that's going to, is going to play, but it doesn't have to be a China story alone. Tesla does their own event driven reductions and the uh, producer prices, a lot of commodities just globally have come down over the last couple of quarters and that will continue. Terminally, so Tesla, you know, the average 3Y um, COGS was, a, I think, 36, um, I think 659, if you average them across in the last quarter. I believe they've gotten that down another 3 to 4% before all of these COVID increases. They were already running 3 to 4% lower, but that was two years ago. Now the designs they're building now are less expensive. They've they've already they've already simplified them. So I think the terminal cogs rate could be continue to go much much lower. The headwinds, just to be very clear and very balanced, the headwinds Model Three ramp. The new Model Three ramp is going to be slower than the existing Model Three in the factory in the beginning. So that'll have some drag, but it's going to be on lower volumes. And then the Cybertruck ramp, that'll be a net drag. But again, lower volumes, lower volume attribution. You know, seventy. You know, ninety percent of what Tesla builds are Model Three and Y. Thank you, Jeff, so much. We appreciate you so much. This is why you are so valuable. Um, there's few people that know so much about supply chain, cost of goods, and how they kind of compare to these price cuts. And you put it in context. Thank you, Jeff, for doing that, folks. Follow Jeff at the Jeff Lots on Twitter. <laughs> It's very brilliant analysis. And we thank you, Jeff, because I know that you basically reply to many of these um, uh, comments from Tessa Q or other people who are pointing out, you know, just 
different interpretations. You come out with putting it in context. Thank you for doing that. Here's another one, though, that kind of maybe actually is true, right? Which is this, this tweet that showed that Tesla's margins, operating margins, are getting thinner, it appears. So this is a 2023 second quarter. The operating margin for Tesla is at 11%. And then, you know, they compared it to the other automakers. And Tesla is only at 6%. So while we think that the operating margin is so high, this shocked me a little bit, Jeff. Can you explain to me? Because yeah. I had a, uh, I knew that the auto gross margin was industry leading. 30% at one point fell to 20% and 18% now. Still very much industry leading compared to what I understand to be the average automaker is 7.5%. But operating margin was supposed to be what Tesla's focused on and everything they're doing is robots. Uh, factories are so efficient. Is this because of just the R and D that they're investing, or what's going on? Yeah, can you? The, the, I think the first thing you have to do is is understand that this is a still table of data, meaning there's no trend um, yeah. on this chart. If there were trends, it would show you that Tesla has taken a couple of quarters of on the on the downside. It would show you a couple of successive quarters of decline in in operating margin. Um, but but now you've got to start peeling back the data. So one Ferrari luxury car maker, you know, selling three, four hundred thousand yeah. dollar cars. Okay, Agreed. let's put that to the side yeah. for a minute. Same Porsche, Porsche yeah. has recently um, increased their prices. Porsche increased their prices and their volumes in North America, um, at least on EV, have dropped, I think, 30, 40 percent um, since they've done that. So they want to do that. That's fine. But you know, they're, they're, you can see their operating margins is uh, sorry, their operating income has fallen uh, is below Tesla. So I don't, I don't believe they're on a good trajectory, raising prices and reducing volumes. Their costs are, are going to go up. Um, Stellantis put up a good quarter in, in in operating profit and margin, but guess what? They're rolling into right now. They're rolling into UAW uh, negotiations where UAW has threatened to shut them down. And they want 40% labor increases. Labor is one of the biggest components of COGS uh, to general assemble a car. So they're going to be under pressure um, on this. Um, Mercedes and BMW. So Tesla was, was recently above them. And that's why I say this is a point in time for Tesla. I believe their margins have been under compression because of the pricing moves they made. The pricing moves were very you know, staunch at the end of Q4 of last year, Q1. And then the rate slowed down in Q2. In Q2, Tesla's ability to reduce COGS exceeded how what kind of pricing reduction it did on the MSRP side. And the other thing about Tesla versus anybody in this list, who on this list is making humanoid robots? Who on this who on this list is doing um, generalized AI and in, in, in AI and in, in full self driving, um, you know, internal R and D to their to their company? So. There's a big amount. And then who on this list is expanding their production capacity as fast as Tesla? All of these things are going to hit, you know, these lines. And so you have to take that into account. It's like, what is Tesla doing? They're, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously building for a gigantic future and gi gigantic success. And all you have to do is watch the EV adoption curve to know that 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 pie is there and that pie is increasing. And Tesla is the one that has the unit economics to actually go for it and build. Remember, there's not a, there's another table that we could put in here, is, which is who's building an EV at, at positive operating margins. And it's not the only, the only company that we know of that's splitting it out um, that builds, that is, is, is Ford. So, and we just, we, we believe that all other companies are negative in EV gross margins. I don't know if there's a good case. Maybe someone can comment in the video if they believe there's a good case of somebody doing positive operating margins. Remember B BYD does gas powered and hybrid vehicles and EVs. EVs are about half of what they ship. And of the, the last time that BYD and, and, and Tesla synced up, I think it was Q1 of this year, in terms of you know comparing operating margins and just looking at the data and byd had to ship eight byd cars to, to have the equivalent operating income of of one tesla so um so they they have some you know they have some some work to do to to catch up so there's a number of factors I, the point is there's a number of factors to look at and not just that 
that one still table. I believe Tesla is, is in the middle of a bottoming process now. Heavy investment for the future for massive expansion, both factories and R&D. Nobody on that list can match what they're doing both in manufacturing and R&D uh, expansion. Wow, yeah, that was amazing. Thank you for doing that again. I'm just blown away that you were able to go down each of the line items. You're right, I'm mean, at the end of the day, if Tesla just did autos and that's all they did, their operating margin would be just through the roof and they're in growth mode and so forth. So thank you for explaining that. It makes me feel a little bit better, but I think that uh, regardless of everything you said, operating margin will continue to grow. The next topic I'm very, very excited about, I want to spend some time on this because it's about the net promoter score. We've got data now coming, showing you what Tesla's net promoter score is in China compared to the Chinese auto manufacturers against the legacy or European and auto manufacturers in the US. So the net promoter score is one of the best metrics that many industries are using, many companies are using to measure um, the customer satisfaction. How And the question is how likely are you to recommend this product or brand to your friends? So I'm just gonna quickly explain this promoter score and then you can explain it because you're the expert because you were the chief quality officer for a couple of large corporations, Motorola and LG. Um, I was Lenovo. actually in Lenovo and I was right. uh, myself very much involved with WAMA, Word of Mouth Marketing Association. So I'm very familiar with this as well. But basically a company the, the way it goes is, is that instead of you asking 25 questions to your customers and asking them how satisfied they are, the best question that they found to correlate the best is to ask the one question, how likely are you to recommend this company to your friends? And the promoters who are 10 and 9 who say, I'm very likely out of a scale of 10 to recommend you, they're usually, they'll score you at 9 to 10. We call them promoters. A detractor, somebody says zero to one, I will not recommend you to my friends and anybody between the two, or sorry, six, anything under six is a detractor, but a seven and eight, we call them passives. You know, they're not quite yet sure how likely they are, but they're positive. And so if you take that and you take the promoters minus the detractors, you get the net promoter score. Okay. And so if we look at the kind of like what's happened here, the news that we're going to report today is these are the net promoter scores for the automakers in China in the first half. And Lee Auto is in first place. Neo second, Tesla's third, BYD fourth. Um, so if you look at the list here, this is Lee Auto, then there's Neo, Tesla at 80, and BYD at 78.3. So they're very high. They're all in above 80. So that's incredible compared to most other companies. And let me see if I've got an actual uh, chart here. Yeah. So here's a good example. If you can see here that, you know, the world class is anything over 70%. You got Costco at 79, um, USAA at 79%. Then you got Apple at 63%. And we all know what a brand they are. Nordstrom, Netflix, we know how incredible they are. They're only at 60%, which is still very, very good. And then, of course, we'd expect companies like Comcast actually having a negative uh, net promoter score, meaning majority of people are detractors, not positive. So it just gives you a sense of what numbers we're looking at here. Um, so Amazon is at 69 which shockingly, because they're just really good company. And you can see some other kind of companies here as they fall in. Apple, if you break it down by product, you know, the brand is a 63 and you can see the iPhone's only 51 and we know how much people love the iPhone and the iPod, the AirPods, but this is how you can see how likely are they to recommend their friends. And that's a little bit of a shock that it's actually lower than I would expect. And then here's the top companies again. Tesla is at 97. That's crazy. Is this real, uh, Jeff? Is this real that they're at 97? Yeah, that's a, that's a good um, explanation, descriptor of NPS, Herbert. And, and, and I think for the viewers, I think it's important to put this in context. When you see the tweet out there of the of the one person that says, look at my panel gap or or my 12 volt battery died, you know, a week after I got the car. Those are regrettable to companies. And again, as a former chief quality officer, any type of early defect or, you know, we call them out of box or early life failure um of course or any failure inside of the product's life but really those early life failures are super regrettable and we focus on trying to prevent those and basically get them to zero but i think what's helpful is social media and, and to put this all in context is social media will take that one incident and tesla q forwards these things around and they'll, it'll take that and it will amplify it 
But what, what it won't amplify is that 4 million Tesla vehicles were sold and basically 97% of those people questioned when they were asked the question of, would you recommend a Tesla to your friends? And 97% and of those people said they would. Basically, 3.88 you know, million people said that they would. Um, that, you know, that, that data doesn't come out in aggregate. And that's why we measure NPS is to understand that. When, you're, when you measure NPS, you're also looking at trends as you release new products. As you, can you do it by region? Can you do it by product? Can you do it, you know, um, you know, you try to slice it a number of different ways and you're trying to understand because your, your same product could be received poorly in different regions just based on, you know, did you design for a particular factor? I'll give you an example. Um, there's a, a particular temperature that's comfortable on the face uh, for a smartphone, for the, for the screen on a smartphone and, and, and also for the backside of a smartphone and smartphone uh, suppliers or manufacturers will design to that spec and they'll work very aggressively. They'll add cogs to the product to spread the heat out to, you know, they'll even reduce, you know, you know, they'll throttle the CPU, all these things to keep the heat down. But guess what? That, that, that's temperature spec in the U S is different than than the temperature spec that's needed in India, just due to the, the average ambient temperature uh, in that country versus here. And so you could design a product, get everything beautiful, packaged, ready to ship, and realize that you don't have a product that works and would be highly sat you know, satisfactory in that region you're shipping in, you know, in this example I gave. So this, this also speaks to the ability for Tesla to, sh to design and build a product that people love globally. Now, when you looked at that China data and you saw everybody bunched up, Li Auto, uh, Neo, Tesla, all bunched up around 80. What you're looking for there is like, you're not looking like, are you 81 versus 82? You're looking, are you at 80 versus 40 for Mercedes Benz? That's what you're looking for. Are you in the 60s for VW? That 70 threshold's important, but you're also kind of looking comparatively in Audi at 48.8. So, uh, those those Chinese brands are connecting to the consumer base there locally. I'm not surprised. By the way, this also you know, speaks to the you know the you know, people like what about BYD? Are they just building like junky cars and and just shipping them in volume? Well, their China their China um, population buying the cars would tell you no. They're China. They'll they'll say that they like their cars. Uh, the question now is, will those cars? What would be the NPS of a BYD going to Europe? What are their expectations? So this is how MPS can get very interested when you slice it by region, you slice it by product, and then you bring it up to the company level. And at a company level, this is one of the most exciting things to me for to being a Tesla investor is they've made a product that people love and that they'll recommend word of mouth. That's, that's super critical. And that may be also feeding why Tesla, you know, believes that they can underserve in terms of marketing spend because they've got, you know, phenomenal, you know, just off the charts NPS score. Okay. And then I wanted to share with you guys kind of like what this Lee Autos is, because this is Lee, it was number one. So this is what they look like. They're pretty good cars. They look fantastic. This is a Lee 7. Um, there's a Lee, there's an L7, L8, and L9. The L7 uh, sells for 319 yuan, thousand, which is divided by seven. It's around 42, 45,000 US dollars. That's their cheapest cars. They're expensive, but it looks great. Look at that. Um, this is the L8. And then uh, pretty, pretty significant. This is the inside of the L8, large space. Looks very good. This is the L9. So this is... Uh, Four hundred twenty-nine, four hundred thirty thousand uh, dollars yuan divided by seven. So what is that? Sixty thousand dollars, right? Six times seven, thirty-five. Six times. Help you out, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, then, and then I wanted to. Now. Yeah. So I wanted to show this, which is kind of interesting. <clears throat> I love this chart so much. This is the Chinese battery ev market share in 2022 fiscal 2022 on the column is market share and on the right is price so you can see that you know when you hear that tesla is not 
you know, is being outsold in the U.S. or in China. You got to remember that Tesla plays in the very expensive area. So if you see down below, that's the price point. They're at the far end, yet they are the number one selling vehicle in China. And you can see the Model Y, Model 3 competes against the BYD, Han, and the Zeker. And then you can see that the other companies like Wu Ling is like the sub <laughs> five ten thousand dollar cars. It's a tiny little compact. It's uh, selling like crazy, of course. But all these other China, like BYD, is all over here, but they're much cheaper, kind of different kind of cars. So you got to remember, what what are you comparing? The premium against each other or not? And I don't know why Lee's not here, Lee Auto. Uh, I kept searching for it. But this is 2022, and it turns out that now in 2023, they've had three full months where they're selling 20,000 Lee Autos per month. So they yeah. should have shown up here, and I'm kind of confused why it's not uh, here. Yeah, but the point of the chart here. is the point of the chart is where's Tesla playing versus where um, some of the other players are. And I think I think it's a good chart. And uh, Lee Auto, Lee Auto's doubled volumes um, year over year. They're doing really well. The other, the other, I think the um, the key takeaway here is would be a great chart if we could find it is margin share. This is how Apple dominated. You know, there were. Yeah. lower volumes yeah. versus others but they had you know the margin share of like the you know total yeah. margin dollars uh, and i think that's where tesla is is dominating here and doing well uh and much better than than byd because again a lot of people think that as soon as these companies like a byd they get let's say they become number one in ev volume that that's just going to solve um all their cost problems the answer is no like you could start out structurally inefficient from a unit economics perspective and you can have all the volume in the world and you're not going to solve your cogs problem. You're going to improve it, but you're not going to solve it. You have to start out with, you know, with building up the right unit economics for the product, getting the right cost structure in the bill of material, designing it in a way that meets a certain price point, having the manufacturing methods that are high automation, low labor count, uh, high velocity through the factory, high output per square meter in the factory. These are the critical things. Um, but I would keep an eye on Lee Auto. Um, shout out one of my former colleagues um, that I work with very closely at Lenovo, was the president and founder of Lee Auto. So I, I know him very well, and uh, they're a talented team. I think they're going to do really well. Uh, but again, they've got to get up the margin curve as well. And they, remember, you know, Tesla, you know, the three and the Y are, are basically based off of 2017 design technology. So as soon as they get this Highland refresh out there, and then as soon as they get the Gen 3 car out there, they're going to be a, a, a real, um, you know, China's going to be very competitive, and, but Tesla is going to compete there and do well, I believe. Hey there, thank you for joining me. If you can, please consider supporting this channel so I can keep it going. It's a lot of work arranging all these amazing interviews. One of the easiest ways is just to click that join button and become a member of the channel. Thank you very much. Let's get brighter. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Again, I love that you're so well connected. You know, Lee Auto executives, um, you know, quite a few folks that you can't share with us. Um, even me, Jeff, you need to share <laughs> more of your connections, but uh, I'll slowly get it out of you. Yeah. So just to compare what the um, U.S. car manufacturers and the German of the auto Europe car manufacturers are doing, this is Ford's that promoter score. They're at 21. Man, um, yeah. they're not doing well. This is not, this is terrible. This is like bottom of the pack. And uh, if you look at the German auto in China, so remember we just showed you where uh, Tesla is number three or in the, uh, at the 80s or something like that. This is Volkswagen at 8064, BMW, Audi, Mercedes. These guys yeah. are not doing well. In fact, they are, they're backing out. They're trying to, and what happened? Out and what happened to them? The volumes followed the NPS score. So as their NPS yeah. score declined, the volumes followed with it. As the China NPS scores ascended, they're closer to the customer. They know what they want. Um, they're attentive. Um, their their NPS scores, you know, have been ascending. So and so are their volumes. So NPS is important. You know, the correlating to to both you know financial and volume and share results and overall success of a company. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. This was a really good show. You just shared so much information about margins and, uh, and net promoter score, which is you're an expert in. 
there's lots of news in Cybertruck, and um, we've seen more and more of the Model 3s. Thank you very much, Jeff. Appreciate everybody. Follow him on Twitter at uh, the Jeff Lutz. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Thanks, Jeff. Herbert.